excited about joining you guys live today. One of the number one things that the women in our community have said they struggle with, actually not one of the, the number one thing that the women in our community have said they struggle with is energy. And as women who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s and beyond, having really good energy is not only important for our quality of life, it's important for our sanity. As women, we take on the world, you know, we take on so much responsibility for our families, for our partnerships, for work. And when our energy bottoms out, it is like the most frustrating, debilitating, disempowering feeling. You guys know a lot of my own stories around energy issues, especially after my surgery in 2011. And I feel a lot of empathy and camaraderie um, with all of you who are struggling with energy. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about our Facebook Live today with Ari Whitten. I met Ari last year and heard so many people in our community just talk about his work and how really special his work um, has been in our community for helping women and men get a handle on this energy issue. So I have a whole list of questions here um, and I'm super excited to dive into this conversation with you today, Ari. Why don't you just kind of start off by telling us how did you get into this whole energy paradigm? I know you had your own journey with, um, with energy issues. Yeah, well, I know this is a 30 minute roughly interview. So I'll give you the super, super ultra right. version of my background. Um, I've been studying health for a very long time since I was a, a teenager. Um, and, you know, typical teenage stuff at that time, I was interested in biceps and abs. So I was into weightlifting and nutrition and fitness and fat loss and muscle building. And that was my world for many years. My older brother was a personal trainer and bodybuilder. And I was kind of in that sort of realm. Uh, and then I got, over the years, I got more interested in health more broadly. Um, I went on to do my bachelor's degree in kinesiology, emphasis in exercise physiology, and was a personal trainer and nutritionist for many years. Thought I wanted to be a doctor, went to medical school for two years, hated it. Um, you know, basically just being in a hospital, uh, you know, just imagine somebody with 10 years of background in nutrition and lifestyle, being in a hospital, seeing people with diabetes and heart disease, diseases of nutrition and lifestyle, uh, being fed a terrible diet and literally receiving zero education on anything related to nutrition and lifestyle and just being prescribed one drug after another. It's, you see, it's common to see people on 12 or 15 or 18 different prescription drugs. And again, being taught nothing about nutrition and lifestyle. So I basically was tortured for two years in that environment, eventually decided that this is not for me. I can't take many more years of putting up with this insanity. Uh, went to do a PhD program in clinical psychology, completed that and then realized I didn't really wanna be a, a talk therapist either. Uh, uh, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to use my background in nutrition and, uh, and, and lifestyle. And one of the things if you get if you actually get a license in psychotherapy, it's sort of this weird irony, but getting the license actually limits you from, from a full scope of practice. So in other words, having that license, if I then integrate nutrition into what I'm doing with, with my patients, um, they can revoke my license for practicing outside of the scope of what I'm licensed for. So it's this weird irony where you are actually less limited to practice the way that you want to practice um, by not having the license <laughs> as opposed to having it. So uh, basically did my PhD program and then, and then basically started writing books on health and teaching people about that um, and started the brand that I, that I now have, which is the Energy Blueprint, um, which has been a, a, a wild ride and um, extremely successful and fun and fulfilling work. And this sort of the personal element for me is that when I was in my mid twenties, I got mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus. And um, for about six months or a year after that, I was severely chronically fatigued. And, you know, I'd been a fit guy, healthy guy, active all my life. And this just kind of wiped me out and debilitated me. And that's what really put fatigue on my radar at that point was realizing 
that when you have fatigue, when you're chronically fatigued, your life goes to goes down the, the crapper for lack of a better word. Like everything suffers in your life, your, your career, your life's work, your passions, your relationships, your friendships, your relationships with family, everything suffers um, when you have chronic fatigue. So that's when I really started to get obsessed with that topic specifically. And as I explored, and, and we can talk about some of the details of this, but as I explored that topic in, in great depth, I realized that there really was not very good information out there on this subject of chronic fatigue and kind of an understanding of the science of what causes it and how to fix it. Um, and that's when I really decided to devote my life to, that's when I founded the Energy Blueprint and really decided to devote my life to building out a comprehensive science-based understanding of what causes fatigue and how to overcome it and dramatically increase your energy levels. Well, you're definitely speaking our language. One of the topics that gets a lot of airtime in the Healing Rosie Facebook group and in my personal email, um, people email me directly because I talk about this subject a lot is Epstein-Barr. I personally um, have struggled with Epstein-Barr. The practitioner I'm working with suspects that I had a chronic uh, low-grade Epstein-Barr issue for about 30 years. Um, and last year I started doing homeopathics and doing some things that really started clearing that for me. And I noticed a substantial difference in my energy levels, even with a hypothyroid diagnosis, you know, so there's a lot of women in our community who are dealing with and with statistics like 90% plus of us have Epstein-Barr and with a medical community that wants to tell everyone that it's a past infection and it's not relevant to them anymore. You can imagine in our group and community when we start talking about something like this, people start coming out of the woodwork, you know, trying to figure this out for themselves. But as you just said, it's one thing to get a diagnosis, then it's now what, what, you know? Okay, so we get a diagnosis of Epstein-Barr or someone tells us that we have adrenal fatigue or chronic fatigue. This comes up in our community a lot. Um, in fact, there's been a conversation recently in our community where someone came out and said, my doctor is subscribing this set of supplements for adrenal fatigue. And then a lot of other women come out and say, yeah, if your doctor is subscribing supplements for your adrenal fatigue, he doesn't really know what he's doing because I've had this issue too. And here's the things that you need to correct if you're actually going to reclaim your adrenal function. It's not really an issue of adrenal fatigue. And I mean, you can just imagine all the types of conversations that start going back and forth because this is a community of women who have actual experience with these issues and who have tried a lot of methods and modalities from well-meaning functional medicine doctors even and and have mixed results so why don't you talk to us a little bit about adrenal fatigue um, and what you're seeing in your practice is really working for women who are struggling with chronic fatigue sim uh, symptoms yeah so what i'll first say and and i want to preface this by saying what i'm about to say will probably shock a lot of people listening um, don't get mad at me. I promise it will all make sense after I explain a little bit. So reserve the initial reaction and just hear me out and then things will make more sense for you. So um, one of the things I'm actually known for at this point is debunking uh, adrenal fatigue. And you know that's sort of a big part of the work that I do. Now, I've done actually, and, and, I, and I say this without exaggerating, I've, I've done literally the most comprehensive analysis of the research on this topic that anyone has ever done. Um, and I would happily debate anyone in the world on this subject because I know I know this research better than basically anyone at this point. Um, I've compiled literally every study ever done on the relationship of adrenal function and cortisol levels to the fatigue syndromes. Okay. And, and I'll explain more in detail what I mean by that. Um, if you go to Google Scholar or PubMed, which is like Google for scientific research, and you look up the term adrenal fatigue in quotes, you will quickly discover that there is basically no research in existence on the topic of adrenal fatigue. There is literally zero studies ever in existence that have validated the concept of adrenal fatigue. Um, no research that has proved that this is even a legitimate condition. So, <clears throat> and within conventional medicine, you have bodies of 
you know, Institute for, for endo, endocrinologists. Um, I forget the exact name of the Institute, but there's one in particular that represents 14,000 MDs who are endocrinologists. These are hormone specialists, people who know all about the adrenals and cortisol levels. That's what they do with their whole career. And um, they have come out and publicly stated adrenal fatigue is not a real condition. There, there are no scientific studies that um, validate this theory of adrenal fatigue or, or the idea that chronic stress wears out our adrenals and results in low cortisol levels, which then causes fatigue. Okay. So Can I that's ask for the, clarification on that. Sure. I want to understand yeah. when you say there's no studies, no studies doesn't mean it necessarily doesn't exist. So are you saying is your, is what you're explaining to us now, this is not a, th not a thing because there's no studies or there's no studies because there's nothing to study help contextualize that a little bit yeah so that's the next layer to the story so okay um <laughs> so yeah yeah you're totally right that absence of any research testing the theory would not be any sort of uh reason to claim that the the the, the theory doesn't exist here's the thing this idea is not new it's based on han selye's research from the 1930s to the 1950s. This research is almost 100 years old. And the idea, the basic idea that sort of chronic stress wears out your adrenals is a very, very old idea, not novel, not new, not based on any kind of new scientific research. It's a very old theory um, based on very early research into chronic stress and what are what is involved in our body's response to chronic stress. And unfortunately, the theory's just kind of stuck around and gone viral. And, and there's been other players in this. There's a guy named Jeffrey Williams or Jeffrey Smith, I forget, who was back in the 1970s or 80s, who perpetuated the idea that fatigue is a result of your adrenals getting worn out. And so he was pioneering this, uh, you know, basically giving people hydrocortisone to boost their cortisol levels. And that was his cure for fatigue. Um, again, this is 40 years ago or more. Uh, and then back in, I think it was 1999, James Wilson coined the term adrenal fatigue. And that's where the term was originally coined. But the idea that chronic stress wears out our adrenals and causes cortisol abnormalities is a very, very old idea. And what I'm saying is that the idea has been around a long time and has actually been tested. Now, there's no studies on the term adrenal fatigue, but there are actually studies testing the basic idea. So because this idea has been around for a long time, they, they've tested it extensively and they've tested it in the context of other recognized fatigue syndromes. So the, there are fatigue syndromes, one's called burnout syndrome or clinical burnout. Another one is called stress-related exhaustion disorder. Another one's called vital exhaustion. And then arguably you can also lump chronic fatigue syndrome and, or, and fibromyalgia potentially into this as well. All of those have dozens of studies testing adrenal function, HPA axis function, and cortisol levels through all sorts of study designs and all sorts of methods, blood tests, salivary cortisol tests, urinary cortisol metabolite tests, everything that you can imagine, dexamethasone suppression tests to see what's going on in the hypothalamus pituitary, all kinds of layers of tests and these tests have been done for more than 25 years by researchers all over the world. There's over 70 studies that have been done on this topic. I've compiled every single one of them, okay? And actually put this publicly available on my site with all of the quotes of the conclusions, the names of the studies, the screenshots of the studies, the screenshots of like the actual cortisol measurements. And the majority of what the studies do is basically this. Let's take a, a group of people with stress-related exhaustion disorder or vital exhaustion or clinical burnout or burnout syndrome, measure their cortisol levels or their HPA axis function, and then compare it to a, a group of people that are perfectly normal and healthy, okay? And then if this theory of adrenal fatigue is valid, the, the, you know, what you'll find is very simple. What you should find is that there's a very clear connection between adrenal and cortisol abnormalities and these fatigue syndromes, right? I mean, if, if the theory is that chronic stress causes fatigue by virtue of wearing out your adrenal glands 
and causing a cortisol abnormality and poor adrenal function, then if you go find people with chronic fatigue and stress-related exhaustion, you should actually find that they have disturbed adrenal function and disturbed cortisol levels. Here's the problem. When you actually compile all this research, you don't find that. You find that the vast majority of these people have perfectly normal cortisol levels and adrenal function. Perfectly normal. Okay. So just that, and, and there's lots of nuances. I've I, I can talk, I've actually done podcasts on this topic. I, I have several hours worth of podcasts going through all the layers of the science on this in, in great depth. So I'm giving you the five minute summary here. Um, but just that simple fact alone, that it is possible to have these fatigue syndromes and not have any adrenal or cortisol abnormality. And not only is it possible, but the vast majority of people with these fatigue syndromes have perfectly normal adrenal function and cortisol levels. That by itself already tells you that the primary cause of these conditions cannot be adrenal, adrenal fatigue or cortisol abnormalities, okay? It's, it's basically the equivalent, like let's say um, there was a particular condition and it involved lapses of short-term memory and other symptoms like you have pain in your right knee and you got an itch in your left elbow and you fall asleep several times during the day and you have whatever else you got brain fog and you have just this constellation of symptoms in this particular condition and then somebody had the theory i think this this condition is caused by human herpes virus six right and, and it sounds like a good theory. It sounds plausible, seems to make sense. You know, there things somewhat line up, but then you actually go and study it and you realize, oh, the majority of these people who have this condition don't actually have any infection with human herpes virus six. They've never had it and they don't have it now. And there's no indication that they have it, right? So if, if that's the case, what any good scientist does is they discard that theory. They recognize that the evidence does not support the theory. Now we got to come up with a new theory that's a better theory that can, can explain this, right? The problem is the evidence doesn't support the adrenal fatigue theory, but people are still holding on to it. They're not discarding it and trying to come up with a better theory. Mm -hmm. um, it's still just basically this meme that's going around in the natural health community and the functional medicine community that people believe in despite the fact that the evidence doesn't support it. And the main reason why is that nobody has actually looked at the evidence. People just assume that if there's dozens of books being written on it and there's thousands of articles online, um, that it must be legitimate. Well, here's the problem. Go look at any of those books and any of those thousands of articles online. See if you can find one study that validates the theory of adrenal fatigue and says this study or many studies that prove this is what's going on. This is what's causing it. You can't find it. Those studies don't exist. The actual research on this, on this subject uh, proves that adrenal fatigue does not exist. Okay. And, and there's more layers to this we can talk about. But again, the, the vast majority of people with these fatigue syndromes have perfectly normal HPA axis function and cortisol levels. So I'll let you take it from where you want to take it from. Yeah, here. I mean, I think the obvious question, and I actually have quite a few questions from the community that are, are aligned with this is, and I hear what you're saying. I think, I think if I'm just looking at it from my vantage point in the space that I occupy in kind of our little cosmic pool here, um, so many women are complaining about fatigue and men too, but I think it's much more pervasive with women. Um, and, you know, we're just looking for that quick, what's the answer? How do we fix it? rather than, you know, probably peeling back the layers like we should and studying this appropriately. And, with, and so many of us want, we want a diagnosis, not necessarily because we want the label, but we want the path to fix it. So that's what's coming up for me, you know, in all of this is, okay, so you kind of combed through the research, debunked the idea that what's responsible for our fatigue is weak adrenals or adrenals that have been worn down, you know, fill in, fill in the gap, like where do we need to go with this conversation? Yeah, good question. So um, what I'll first say to, to clarify all the people who are listening to this who are angry at me right now, <laughs> is, um, I am not saying that your fatigue 
does not exist and your symptoms do not right. exist. Your symptoms are real. Your fatigue is real. What I am saying is that the mechanism and the major cause behind that fatigue is not worn out adrenals from chronic stress. Okay. And even if you've had a cortisol measurement test, um, this is a quick digression, but even if you've had, for the people who've had a cortisol measurement test and they've, they've been shown to have low morning cortisol or a flat diurnal curve of cortisol, um, what people would be shocked by is if you actually go and look at the research on chronic stress, and you can look at all kinds of chronic stressors, psychological stress, various kinds of psychological stress, financial stress, work stress, work overload, unemployment stress, uh, social isolation, um, the you know various kinds of other uh, physiological stressors like chronic smoking and chronic drinking and all kinds of things like that. If you actually look at the research on those and cortisol abnormalities, you almost never find any studies that support the idea that any kind of chronic stress is wearing out the adrenals and causing low cortisol levels. Pretty much all of those studies, I'd say 98, 99% of them show uh, slight elevations in cortisol levels. You have slightly higher cortisol levels than somebody who isn't subjected to those kinds of chronic stress, not low cortisol levels. So the research doesn't support even the idea that chronic stress causes low cortisol levels. What causes low cortisol levels? The, what the research actually shows the main cause is, is circadian rhythm disruption. So disruption of your biological clock, wake and sleep cycles, and that has to do largely with light exposure. It has to do with whether you're a night owl or you're a morning person. Just to emphasize this point, and this is something we could dig into for an hour, but if you look at research on, cor on cortisol measurements in people who are either night owls or morning people, okay? Perfectly normal, healthy people. I'm not talking about people with fatigue, no, no symptoms, no chronic stress, nothing. The only difference in these perfectly normal, healthy people is that one group are, are morning people and the other group are night owls, night people. If you measure their cortisol levels, the night owls will have morning cortisol levels that are literally half of what the morning people are. Okay, And they're low enough that if those people went and saw uh, a doctor who believes in adrenal fatigue, they would be diagnosed with adrenal fatigue. And they would say that those doctors would say, hey, chronic stress is wearing out your adrenal glands because look at this test. This is where your cortisol levels are. They're very low. And, uh, chronic stress isn't wearing out their adrenal glands. They're just a night owl. And they're just going to bed too late and waking up a little too, uh, too late. And that's, that's what happens to the hormonal profile in somebody who is a night owl or just somebody who has poor circadian rhythm and sleep habits. That's what happens. So the research doesn't support the idea that chronic stress causes that cortisol abnormality, but it does support the idea that, that, court, that uh, circadian rhythm and sleep disruptions cause it very, very fast. That you, and there's no need for it to even wear out your adrenals over a period of time. This can cause it in a matter of two days. You know, and there are studies actually showing that if you just ask people to shift to a, a night shift work, you'll see that cortisol abnormality. So it's about how the adrenals are affected by the circadian clock in the brain. Circadian rhythm regulates your sleep and wake cycles. Cortisol follows a circadian pattern. It gets high in the morning and then it goes down the rest of the day. It's controlled by the circadian clock in your brain. So if you don't have a strong circadian rhythm and good circadian rhythm and sleep habits, that rhythm gets disrupted. So it gets blunted in the morning and then it usually um, is oftentimes elevated in the evening. So anyway, it's a, it's a bit of a digression, but for, I just wanted to mention that for people who have actually had these cortisol tests and they're like, okay, well, if my adrenal fatigue isn't the reason why my cortisol is like that, then what is, you know, if it's not chronic yeah, we, stress wearing out my adrenals. We talk about this a lot in our community. Actually, I'm a big fan of the amber glasses and amber bulbs and right. getting to bed, you know, no later than 11. And this is something we talk about a lot. And I'm not sure that everyone has connected the dots um, on um, the cortisol stress piece tied to the circadian piece. So that was a really great explanation. 
of how it works. And one of the things that I'll do for this live, I'm going to go back and add a couple of links to amber glasses and bulbs on Amazon, just to make it super easy for anyone watching who is really resonating with art, with what Ari is saying here and wants to put this to the test quickly. Um, I will say just for some context, in my experience, I was a chronic night owl um, from 18 to 35. Like I didn't go to bed before 2 a.m. ever. Um, and it took me six months to re-regulate my circadian rhythms. I mean, they were so disturbed. I was getting to bed earlier and doing the amber glasses, but I would still wake up feeling like I'd been hit by a Mack truck and it took some time. One of the things that was helpful to me um, and kind of getting over the hump was doing cold baths. Um, so that really supported my body and kind of re-regulating, but this is something that I know tons of women are struggling with. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, to, to get back to your main question is if it's not the adrenals, then what is it? Well, you now know, I guess two things, just to recap, you now know that it's not your adrenals and your cortisol levels that are the cause of your fatigue. And, and unless you have Addison's disease, which is a very rare condition unrelated to this concept of, um, of adrenal fatigue. And that may be a legitimate thing that some tiny portion of people have, but that's unrelated to this whole theory of adrenal fatigue. Um, and you know that if, even if you've had low morning cortisol measurements uh, and, and you've, you've had that done and even been diagnosed with adrenal fatigue, what you actually likely have going on is just circadian rhythm and sleep disruption, okay? So that's that. Now the question is, what are the causes of fatigue and stress-related exhaustion? So chronic stress can absolutely cause exhaustion. There's also other factors that can cause fatigue. So for example, infections, for example, toxins. And none of these require invoking any theories around adrenal function and cortisol. It's, it's this kind of bizarre thing that we even got obsessed with this one pathway, uh, this one hormone that plays a role in energy. There's no research to show that cortisol is sort of this master regulator of our energy levels. There are dozens of hormones and neurotransmitters and physiological systems and mechanisms that are involved in regulating our energy, energy levels. Cortisol is one of many dozens of things that is involved in our energy levels. So what are some of these other layers? Well, I'll give you just a few examples. Um, it's been shown that just chronic inflammation by itself can suppress mitochondrial energy production. Mitochondria are the energy generators in our cells. This is literally what's producing our, our energy at the cellular level. If you have chronic inflammation of, from any kind, whether it's from toxins, whether it's from poor diet, whether it's from sleep deprivation, whether it's from um, whatever, whatever, whatever thing, okay, leaky gut, or any, any of those things, that chronic inflammation directly suppresses mitochondrial energy production, okay? To totally unrelated to any adrenal, you know, sort of related mechanism. You directly suppress the ability of your cells to produce energy just by having chronic inflammation. What can cause chronic inflammation? All kinds of things. A poor diet can cause it. Sleep deprivation and circadian rhythm can cause it. Uh, circadian rhythm disruption can cause it. Gut permeability can cause it. Okay. And these are very, very common things. So if you have just, let's look at just this one layer of the story. And this is, act, there's research actually showing that this is in fact going on in people with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. So this is, there's actually research basically proving that this is going on in a large portion of people. If you have dysbiosis, an imbalance of good and bad bacteria, which we know is happening in a majority of people with chronic fatigue, and you have gut permeability, now you have lipopolysaccharide uh, or endotoxin, a particular type of toxin from the, these bacteria in the gut that are directly leaking into your bloodstream. There's a mountain of research on the ability of lipopolysaccharide to cause chronic inflammation in the body. So if you, ha and, and in addition to that chronic inflammation, the lipopolysaccharide itself, that molecule, the very presence of it, directly suppresses the ability of mitochondria to produce energy, okay? So just that alone, just this, looking at this one mechanism is enough to cause fatigue by directly suppressing the ability of your cells and your mitochondria to produce energy. 
So you don't have to invoke this sort of complicated theory of, mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, it's chronic stress, it's wearing out your adrenals, and then your cortisol levels are slightly abnormal, and cortisol is involved in helping to liberate blood glucose and stabilize your blood sugar, and then therefore by cortisol being disrupted and then the blood sugar being disrupted, then your you, then your cells have a harder time producing energy. Like, no, you don't. It's it's a if you think about it, it's a really like kind of convoluted, weird idea that people have become obsessed with. That's like just one little piece of the puzzle of what's involved in in regulating energy levels. There are many direct pathways of of simple direct things like in any source of inflammation, gut permeability, lipopolysaccharide directly suppressing the ability of your cells to produce energy. Um, another example, toxins. Many types of toxins, whether BPA, um, phthalates, heavy metals, all kinds of things, glyphosate, all kinds of things like this can directly suppress mitochondrial energy production. Okay, like you, you don't need to invoke adrenals and cortisol and blood sugar and all these kinds of things. You're, the, the presence of the toxins are directly suppressing the ability of the cells to produce energy. Uh, another example, there's so many here. Um, another one that we could talk about is light exposure. So light is playing a huge role in the ability of our body to produce energy. There's, there's five different types of bioactive light. That's light that's, that's, that's literally active at the biological level in humans. Um, real quick summary of them. One is blue light, and that enters our eyeballs, feeds back into the circadian clock in our brain, and helps regulate our circadian rhythm. Our circadian rhythm controls all sorts of hormones, things like um, cortisol, things like thyroid hormone, things like um, leptin, ghrelin, all, all sorts of hormones that play a role in appetite regulation, metabolism regulation, and neurotransmitters. It affects things like dopamine and serotonin and orexin, which is a neurotransmitter that most people haven't heard of, but it plays a key role in regulating our energy levels. So just that one mechanism of one of the wavelengths of light and the timing that we're getting that affects lots and lots of hormones and neurotransmitters that impact on our energy levels. Uh, another layer of light exposure is UV light. We get UV light on our skin. We're supposed to get it, but most people, uh, most people uh, and, and most of the surveys I've done show that probably like 80% of people are not getting anywhere close to enough sunlight exposure. Okay. And that, that UV light hits our skin, helps with the synthesis of vitamin D. Vitamin D regulates over 2000 genes. It, it regulates the expression of over 2000 genes in our body. Um, also affects immune function, affects inflammation, affects neurotransmitters like endorphins, affects glutamate in the brain, which is another excitatory neurotransmitter that is involved in energy and focus and alertness. Um, and then we also have cholesterol sulfate, which is something else that's simulated with uh, UV exposure that plays an important role in circulatory function and, um, and the, the ability of our blood to flow and uh, key roles in, in brain health. Uh, then we also have red and near infrared light. And this is something that I just wrote a book on uh, last year that's been uh, an amazing success. It's selling like over 3,000 copies a month. And I've sold awesome, like- Awesome, Ari. Yeah, it's like, it's sold over like 30,000 copies since I published it six that's months fantastic. ago. Yeah. Uh, so red and near infrared light, actually unlike UV light or blue light, it doesn't, pen it, it penetrates, sorry, UV light and blue light doesn't penetrate through our skin. Red and near infrared light actually penetrate inches into our body. And what do they do? They actually penetrate in, inside of our cells and they interact directly with our mitochondria in our cells to facilitate mitochondrial energy production. So light is directly affecting our cells ability to produce energy. What happens if you live, uh, you know, typical modern lifestyle where you're indoors all the day and you're not getting sun exposure? So you're lacking all of these different bioactive pathways and all of them are affecting the ability of your cells to produce energy. Uh, red and near infrared light is an especially important one 
in energy production also directly decreases inflammation, also builds up uh, the mitochondrial, what's called the ARE, the antioxidant response element, and actually allows your mitochondria to, to be less fragile, to be more resilient in the face of all kinds of stressors. So they, they're less inclined and less susceptible to be overloaded by the stressors of modern life. They can deal with those stressors and be resilient and not be fatigued and exhausted by them. So there's, there's lots and lots of layers to the story. I'll mention one more that's a very important one. And I haven't even covered nutrition yet. Um, you know, we, didn't, we talked very briefly about circadian rhythm and sleep. Um, but another very important layer to this story is the brain's role in, um, in energy regulation. So there are key areas of the brain in the limbic system, in the hypothalamus, um, in the autonomic nervous system and vagal tone. All of those things are absolutely playing a critical role in energy regulation. And, you know, just decreased vagal tone, for example, um, through the vagus nerve can put the body into a, a, a chronically stressed state, um, chronic brain over stimulation. And you get things like brain fog, you get things like brain related fatigue, where somebody engages in a mental task, like just driving or doing a little bit of work or reading a book, and then they feel wiped out, you know, they feel exhausted for hours after that. Um, these, these are signs of brain related problems. Uh, there's also how these lifestyle elements and nutritional elements impact the blood brain barrier. So if you get a leaky blood brain barrier, you can get a, a, this sort of, and to back up, maybe I should explain that we have a barrier that's designed to keep things out of our brain that should be out and let things in that should be in. So it needs to let in like fuel sources, glucose and and, and ketones and things like that and other nutrients that are involved in neurotransmitter synthesis and you know like um, amino acids and things like that. Uh, and it's designed to keep certain things out like toxins, for example. Well, it's possible for that, for that barrier to become leaky, just like your gut can become leaky, the blood brain barrier can become leaky. They're actually related by the way. So if you have a leaky gut, it tends to lead to a leaky blood brain barrier. What happens when it's leaky is you all these th these things that are not supposed to be getting into your brain are now getting into your brain, and uh, they are now causing damage directly to brain areas, and they're causing neuroinflammation and excitotoxicity. And that means excessive um, presence of excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate in particular, uh, and that basically leads to uh, a sort of downward, a vicious cycle where the brain gets chronically stuck in stress mode and can't get out of, out of that stress mode. And that, that basically just creates a mess in terms of your nervous system regulation of, of everything. So um, anyway, th these, are, these are a number of layers of mechanisms of the real factors that are involved in fatigue. Uh, and we need to let go of this very simplistic model of chronic stress wears out your adrenals, right. causes cortisol problems, and that's what's causing your fatigue. Um, right. That is, at best, a very, very minor player and, and, and probably in most cases, not even a player at all. Mm -hmm. Let's, um, I have several questions here from the community and I just want to cherry pick a few of these um, that I think will kind of round out this conversation. Um, Naomi says, everyone talks about how exercise is bad if you have adrenal issues or fatigue issues, but why? Yeah, good question. So. Um, first of all, let's look at it not in the context of adrenal fatigue specifically, sure. but in the context of, let's just call it fatigue. So people with chronic fatigue syndrome are notoriously intolerant of exercise. There's, in fact, the, the sort of key diagnostic symptom of chronic fatigue syndrome um, there, there's no test for chronic fatigue syndrome that can sort of, you can't take a blood test and say, hey, based on this marker, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. It's, it's a symptomatic diagnosis. So the way that it's differentiated and diagnosed, especially differentiated with just depression, um, is one key symptom in particular, and that symptom is called post-exertional malaise. Post-exertional malaise means if you do any physical activity, you feel wiped out for days, okay? 
people with depression don't have that. People with depression often feel energized and they feel better when they do exercise. People with chronic fatigue syndrome get wiped out. Like, and I've seen people who, if they do two minutes or three minutes of exercise, they will, they will be bedridden for three or four days, can't move. Okay, so that's how bad it can be. So what's really going on there is that, and I kind of alluded to this a, few, a couple minutes ago, but um, the cells lose their resiliency in terms of their ability to regulate, to regulate insults or to regulate reactive oxygen species, okay, or free radicals. So there's, there's a balance that should be going on in your cells, what's called a redox balance, where the cells have a certain level of reactive oxygen species, which play actually vital roles. They're not all bad. They play vital roles in signaling certain things. And your cells also have um, an internal antioxidant mechanism with very powerful antioxidants, hundreds or thousands of times more powerful than the kinds of antioxidants that you would take orally. And that balance is, is very critical for the cell to be able to regulate itself properly. Well, one of the things that happens in chronic fatigue is the cell loses proper redox balance and it loses its resiliency and ability to respond to insults, whether they be toxins or whether they be exercise. Exercise actually creates a transient burst of free radicals and reactive oxygen species. So by doing that, it overwhelms the cell's capacity to quench those three radicals to, to have its own internal antioxidant supply that balances and neutralizes them. And basically it just creates an, what's called an oxidative insult. It creates damage from too much, too much oxidative stress. And that damage then shuts down mitochondrial energy production um, and causes chronic inflammation and actually cellular damage. Um, and just through that mechanism I mentioned before, chronic inflammation will shut down energy uh, energy production in the mitochondria, you get a spike of, again, of free radicals and inflammation from doing exercise. If your cells have lost their resiliency and their capacity to deal with that, they're going to be shut down from it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the main mechani mechanism. There's also, you know, part of this, when mitochondria get shut down, they, the cells shift more towards what's called anaerobic glycolysis, which is energy production outside of the mitochondria. And one of the problems with that is now you produce much more lactic acid. It's way more inefficient. So you're, you, you will produce much less energy, but you also produce lots of lactic acid, which can then also cause damage to the cells uh, through that pathway. So you, you basically get unregulated damage and reactive oxygen species and inflammation, which then shut down energy production. That's, that's sort of the main thing. So the solution, is you have to build resiliency back in at the cellular level. You have to build up your mitochondria and you have to build up your cells capacity, the, the internal antioxidant response element. You have to build up that capacity for your cells to deal with stressors again. Mm -hmm. And, and how, how do you know when you've done that successfully? Are you resilient or not? So it's just how you feel after. Is it knocking you on your ass for days or are you able to? Exactly. Yeah. And the way I break this down, so one of the other key layers of having good energy levels and overcoming fatigue is hormetic stress, the concept of hormesis. Hormesis is transient metabolic stress that, and, and we associate that word stress with being a bad thing, um, but transient hormetic stress is actually critical to keep keep resiliency in at the cellular level. That's what keeps our mitochondria big and strong and powerful. So just like lifting a, a heavy weight causes your muscles to grow stronger, and then they become more able to deal with that type of stress, the same thing happens in the internal cellular level at the mitochondria level. If your, cell, if your mitochondria are being exposed to hormetic stressors, like exercise, like heat exposure, saunas, like cold exposure, cold showers, ice baths, things like that, um, like fasting, which is also a hormetic stressor, and like certain kinds of phytochemicals, um, basically the mitochondria actually get stimulated to grow bigger and stronger 
by doing those activities. And the internal antioxidant response element, which fights against, anti uh, fights against oxidants, free radicals, and fights against inflammation, grows stronger and more powerful. When that's all happening well, the cells are resilient to stressors, they're resilient to uh, spikes in reactive oxygen species, and they can deal with a stress like exercise. But if you don't have those elements of hormetic stress built into your lifestyle, the opposite happens. Your mitochondria literally atrophy, just like if you have ever broken an arm or a leg or something like that, and you had a cast on for several weeks, what happens when you get the cast off? All the muscles have atrophied. And the reason why is they haven't been stimulated. So that's happening with our mitochondria. People's mitochondria are literally shriveling and shrinking up and even dying off you're losing some of your mitochondria because of the lack of stimulation. So what happens when you have cells filled with much fewer mitochondria and then the mitochondria that are there are smaller, weaker, and more fragile, mm -hmm. and the antioxidant response element is not as robust and strong, you this lose your resiliency. Yeah. yeah, you lose yeah. your resiliency at the cellular level. So this is a, a big missing piece. Uh, this is something that's not being addressed by most people who are looking to overcome fatigue is you have to build resiliency back in at the cellular, cellular level through exposure to these hormetic stressors. But the key is because so many people are intolerant of exercise, what I found is that a lot of these other hormetic stressors, so for example, certain breathing practices, um, it's called intermittent hypoxic training, and there are specific ways that I do that. Uh, the various kinds of breath holding practices, it's called hypoxia hormesis. And that creates a stimulus for your mitochondria to grow bigger and stronger. Heat exposure, I love saunas. Saunas are incredible. Red and urine for red light therapy is another type of hormesis. Um, and, and cold exposure to some extent. But I really like intermittent hypoxic training and saunas to, to start people off with. And I find that people tolerate them much, much better than exercise. So I start with those kinds of hormetic stress that build up the uh, the internal antioxidant response elements start to build the mitochondria bigger and stronger. And then as you grow that and you build more resiliency at the cellular level, then you, you can get more tolerant of other types of stressors and you can start to reintroduce exercise. All right. That was awesome. Um, I'm looking here at the questions because I feel like we need to like kind of wind this down a little, even though I really want to keep you on for another hour. Um, I'm going to ask a question from Patty. It's a longer one, but I think it's what she's struggling with is probably something that a lot of women in our community are struggling with. Um, and, you know, a lot of these questions, I'm looking here at, at questions from Heidi and Stacy, and a lot of the women in our community who are pretty active. I have a feeling that a lot of these questions are going to be addressed in the Double Your Energy Masterclass training um, that we're offering. I'm going to um, put a link in the status um, update for this right after Ari and I finish. And then um, I'm also going to be sending out um, some emails to you guys to um, kind of walk us through together going through that um, masterclass. But um, I'm going to ask this question here from Patty. She says, I'm 60 and I have had rheumatoid arthritis since I was 14. So you can imagine the amount of drugs I have been on in my life, especially prednisone. I'm off all biological drugs, amurin and methotrexate, and I use CBD oil for pain management. My question is, I was given hydrocortisone, 37 and a half milligram split throughout the day because my adrenals don't function. My problem is now I have to get off the hydrocortisone and I ended up in the ER last Saturday because my blood pressure spiked because of fluid retention. Mm -hmm. I gained 38 pounds in six months last year once the hydrocortisone kicked in. I have been on it two years now. The ER doctor said I need to get off the hydrocortisone, but how? With Good. adrenal issues, my blood pressure has always been low and adding sodium has been recommended for adrenal insufficiency, but salt is bad for hypertension. I don't know what triggered the high blood pr pressure episode. I also have thyroid problems. I'm on a, on a T4, T3 compound. I'm seeing an acupuncturist who's trying to rebalance my organs and hormones. Can you offer any help? Yeah, there's a lot there. Um... What I'll say, I'll answer this somewhat briefly because, um, well, so I'll first say that adrenal insufficiency can be a real thing. There is such a thing as true adrenal insufficiency. I mentioned Addison's disease before. Um, that is a real thing. It is possible to truly have adrenals that cannot produce enough cortisol. I want to be clear though, that that phenomenon, that condition is totally unrelated to the concept of adrenal fatigue. 
It's a totally different thing. It is possible to have adrenals that genuinely cannot produce enough cortisol. Addison's disease is real. You do need to be on cortisone medication if you have that, okay? Because your adrenals, it's not a matter of building up your adrenal health. Your adrenals have lost their capacity to, to produce enough cortisol. So if you have that, first of all, you got to see a doctor and you, you do need to be on cortisone medication. The fact that the ER doctor is telling her to wean off the cortisone medication probably means that she doesn't have Addison's disease. Addison's, di Addison's disease is a rare thing. It's not a common thing at all. Um, so if she doesn't have Addison's disease, what I recommend very simply is see a good functional medicine or holistic doc that actually has experience helping people wean off the cortisone medication. And, and I know, I know several who are good, who, who know how to do that. Well, um, I'm happy to provide recommendations. I don't get anything from it. One person I'll just mention here is Dr. Guillermo Ruiz. Um, he's, he's really good. He's a good friend of mine, knows what he's doing. Guillermo too. I can put a link. He's in, in the group. I'll tag him. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So he, he can definitely help you with that for sure. Um, and I agree with the ER doc that you do need to wean off the cortisone medication. Okay, uh, Guillermo is in the group, so I will tag him. Um, and if you want a private introduction, Patty, I'd be happy to make that for you as well. Guillermo's in Arizona, just so you know, he's in Arizona. Yeah. But I think he does um, phone consults. He does, well. yeah. he does do phone consults and he's excellent, mm -hmm. very conscious doctor. I really like him. He's, yeah. um, he's, been in, he's done some stuff in our group too. Well, Ari, this has been amazing. I'm gonna, as I mentioned, post um, post the link to the Double Your Energy Masterclass. And I I feel like I should book you to come on again. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. And yeah, if, there's if so many. Me, I have a little more time if you want me to address one more question that isn't so. Yeah, we, we can definitely do that. We can do um, one more question. And I if just you feel guys like the, the, the last one was so like, you know, specific, uh -huh. about some very specific sort of medical issues and. Sure. If you guys have questions for Ari too, even after um, this live is over, go ahead and keep dropping your questions in and maybe we can reach out to him again. I can get some quick answers for you. Um, and yeah, we can definitely book you to come on again. So um, so this question is from um, Inez. I think that's how you say her name. Um, how do you detox cells from heavy metals and other toxins as this obviously disturbs mitochondrial function? Good question. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I'll say there's a lot of garbage out there on the subject of detoxing and toxins. Um, so uh, this is, a, this is a potentially a very big topic, but I'll give some of the, the sort of quick summary of it. Um, there are several different detoxification pathways in our body. We have uh, a, a gut detoxification pathway where we are literally pooping out toxins and peeing out toxins. We have our kidneys, we have the digestive tract, we have the liver, and we have the skin pathway as well uh, and sweating. And I'm a huge fan of stimulating the skin detoxification pathway. There's research literally measuring the toxin content in sweat and showing that you're literally sweating out things like BPA and heavy metals. Like if you, and people don't realize it, people think they're just sweating out and it's like water, maybe with a little salt in it, but there's literally things like mercury and lead and all kinds of nasty things in that sweat. So one of the absolute best things that you can do for your health um, is sauna therapy. Saunas are absolutely amazing. At, at stimulating the body to detox. And not only that, but it's a powerful form of heat hormesis. So going back to these hormetic stressors that I mentioned before, um, there's research on sauna use showing that, and I, I wanna emphasize this because it's so impressive. There's research showing that using a sauna to, to I believe it's five times a week, something like that. The, the more often you do it and the longer your sauna sessions, you see a dramatic reduction in uh, your risk of dying from heart disease, your um, risk of getting neurological diseases like Alzheimer's 
And even there's research showing a dramatic decrease in all cause mortality, your risk of dying from any cause. So I think saunas are absolutely amazingly powerful medicine. And one of the big benefits of them, apart from that hormetic effect and stimulating mitochondria to grow bigger and stronger and more resilient, is a direct detoxification effect. You're literally pumping toxins out of your system. Now, of course, you, there's, there's way more complexity to this topic of detoxification. You can get into specific nutrients and bolstering liver function and healing up the gut and you know, kind of s stimulating detoxification pathways with various substances. Um, also, fat loss is a major one because toxins are being stored in fat. So if you can actually um, go through cyclical periods of either fasting or caloric dep deprivation that are actually stimulating fat loss, you in that process, you're releasing toxins that are being stored in your fat cells back into the bloodstream where they can be um, cleansed from the, and eliminated from the body. So combining something like periods of fasting or cyclical calorie, low calorie diets to stimulate fat loss in, in tandem with some of these key nutrients to support liver health and detoxification pathways and sauna therapy in particular uh, is, is absolutely a, a very, very powerful way to, to detox. So um, you can certainly go down the route of all sorts of fancy supplements and, um, and, and chelation therapy and things like that. But I honestly am not convinced that any of that is necessary for the vast majority of people. I think that if you're doing saunas, let's say daily, for example, if you get a sauna at your house and you're pumping sweat out of your system constantly and you use some of the binders, you use things like modified citrus pectin or zeolites um, or activated charcoal and things like that, and you're, you're doing cyclical periods of fat loss, absolutely hugely powerful way of, of detoxing toxins from your system. Yeah, awesome. Alrighty. Well, we've got lots of comments here. Christy says she loves the infrared sauna. sauna. Um, and we've got people asking about different light therapies and stuff. I'm going to include, because I'm familiar with some of the um, healing modalities that you talked about, infrared sauna and stuff. So I'm going to update this status if you guys want to check back in the next hour or so with some links to some things that are really relevant to what Ari has been sharing, just to support you guys and kind of getting started. I know you hear a conversation like this and you want to do something right away about it. So um, I will share that. And like I said, keep sharing your questions. Um, I'm going to be sending out um, some information about the Double Your Energy Masterclass. And we're going to be able to go through that as a community and we can always bring Ari back again. So thanks for staying on a little longer than normal, Ari. This has been really great. Um, I think we're going to get a lot of traffic here um, on this Facebook Live. So I appreciate you taking the time and spending with us today. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on, Misty. All right. My pleasure. We will see you guys soon. Bye-bye.